Over 3,000 years ago, ancient Egypt, one of the most powerful empires of all time. During its 18th dynasty, a young boy just nine years old ascended the throne. His name was Tutankhamun. King Tut might have remained a minor footnote in history, but for an amazing discovery in the 1920s. British archaeologist Howard Carter made a remarkable find. A stunning tomb of gold and artifacts, the trappings of a pharaoh whose people saw him as a living god. Tut's predecessor, the pharaoh Akhenaten, who may have been his father, created turmoil by replacing Egypt's many gods with only one, the Aten, or sun disk. Tutankhamun's plans to restore the traditional beliefs were cut short when he died unexpectedly at just 19 years of age. How he died is still a mystery. Now, come face to face with the boy king. The story of Tutankhamun, the golden king, and the great pharaohs. I'm Bill Curtis. More than 5,000 years ago, an agricultural community was developing in northern Africa, along the banks of the Nile. From modest beginnings, this new state, Egypt, evolved into one of the most powerful empires of all times, ruled by pharaohs whose names are still known to us today. Yet one stands out, Tutankhamun, whose royal burial is said to be the greatest archaeological discovery of all time. Egypt has been called the gift of the Nile because the yearly flooding left a rich silt along the banks that provided the country with fertile soil that produced a wide variety of crops. The country developed a vibrant belief system with many different gods and temples were built as their divine residence. Priests took care of the gods on a daily basis and the kings officiated during ceremonies. Some temples were for state occasions, such as Luxor and Karnak, but others were part of the funerary complexes the kings built to ensure their immortality. Dr. Zahi Hawass is Egypt's general secretary of the Egyptian Supreme Council of Antiquities and a world-renowned archaeologist. The thinking of afterlife built ancient Egypt, built Egypt in my opinion. Without that, you will never see the pyramids. It is the belief from the afterlife who made everyone in ancient Egypt to work for the national project. The national project was building a pyramid or building a tomb. It seems that the ancient Egyptians spent a good deal of their time building for eternity. But why? Early in their history, more than 5,000 years ago, the ancient Egyptians already had a concept of life after death. The Egyptians essentially believed that death was a continuation of life, only better. And so as a result, they stocked their tombs with everything they could possibly need, food, clothing, jewelry, furniture, uh, as well as magical symbols and figures. As time went on and burial procedures became more elaborate, the process of mummification became more involved. Certain types of drying processes were used. Different styles and types of wrappings covered the body. And a variety of jewelry and amulets accompanied the body in the coffin into the afterlife. At some point prior to the old kingdom, embalmers began to remove different parts of the body fearing that their decay might interfere with the preservation of the body. Some organs, like the brain, were discarded. The heart was mummified separately, but it was returned to the body. The lungs, liver, stomach, and intestines were embalmed, and by the fourth dynasty, burials began to include a separate chest for these organs. Most people connect Egypt with the pyramids, they were royal tombs, but represent only one stage in a long series of monuments created for the afterlife of a pharaoh. Early kings had smaller tombs with flat roofs, 
But soon a stepped form evolved, with many layers, like a ladder for the king to ascend to heaven and reside with the gods forever. Pharaoh Djoser's step pyramid was the first monumental building in history constructed entirely of stone. A generation or two later, the true pyramid evolved, four smooth sides rising to more than 400 feet, heights never reached before. It's probably the precision, uh, the way that these were made that astounds us today because a modern house doesn't even have uh, the kind of precision that you can find in this pyramid. Each of the sides are pretty much exactly the same length within less than an inch of each other. These wonders of the fourth dynasty, their precision, their monumentality and their size would never again be duplicated. Securing the pyramid's treasures was a major task and elaborate traps would be designed to capture any trespassers. No matter what security measures were set in place, all the pyramids would share a common fate. All of the tombs were robbed. And you know, even the, the pharaohs realized that. They put in uh, blocking stones, they tried everything. By the 18th dynasty, it was clear, the pyramids were a giant neon sign to say, this way to the gold. In the beginning of the 18th dynasty, the Egyptians changed tactics. They moved the royal cemetery to the south at Thebes. No giant monuments pointed the way to the pharaoh's treasure. These tombs now were hidden, deep within the craggy walls of a bleak area. Well beyond the cultivated fields near the Nile, nothing grew there. It was literally the land of the dead. This isolated location did, however, provide a very significant natural landmark. You know, but the ancient Egyptians, when they came to this valley, they wanted really to hide their tombs. They want to look at a place of silence, a place of mystery, a place that can keep the tombs of, uh, of the kings of the new kingdom who ruled Egypt in the time of the Golden Age. They built pyramids in the Old Kingdom and the Middle Kingdom, but pyramids never saved their mummies. And that's why when they came to the valley, they looked at the top and they saw that peak, which is a shape of a pyramid. And they built all the tombs under this shape. The Valley of the Kings would provide the final resting place for many kings and queens of Egypt's new kingdom. Tombs were prepared, carved sometimes hundreds of feet into the bedrock, meandering down until the final focus, the burial chamber. Yet, despite the secrecy of their construction, official protection of the site and the magical images and spells that adorned the walls, even these tombs were subject to robbery. All that is, except the tomb of the boy king, Tutankhamun. Tutankhamun was born in the palace King Akhenaten built in the new capital city, Armana. A site sacred to no other god, the pharaoh Akhenaten moved there during the 18th dynasty when he broke with tradition and began his religious revolution, which introduced the belief in a single god, the Aten. It wasn't something the Egyptians really liked, apparently, because when Akhenaten died and when Tutankhamun died and then eventually the last successor died, then everything was hacked out, all of the images, every name, everything. And so um, while monotheism may have actually uh, taken root someplace else in Egypt, it was finished. Akhenaten's religion is very, very unsatisfactory for the ancient Egyptian populace because he does not address the question of death and the afterlife. He ignores it utterly. And so when you die, you sleep and you cease to exist. This is not what the ancient Egyptians want to hear. They've been dealing with an, a religion that is all about encapsulating their soul in materiality, that's about their existence in the future. And if you just ignore one of the chief problems of, of humanity, which is death, that we're all going to die, your, your religion will not last. The biggest mistake, in my opinion, that Akhenaten did, that he made the Egyptian to worship the new god through him, is only Atom, the power behind the sun, is giving the hand 
to him and he's giving it to the people. Then when he died, the Egyptians could not find the connection between them and the God. In all likelihood, the young prince Tutankhaten, as he was called then, was born in one of the palaces. It's not known for sure who Tut's father was. DNA samples may provide the answers. Who really the father of Tutankhamun? Is he Akhenaten or Amenhotep III? We do have, for the first time, DNA, and we hope we'll be able to reveal for the first time the members of the family of the golden boy, Tutankhamun. Kia, a secondary wife of Akhenaten, perhaps his mother, died in childbirth. As documented on the walls of her tomb at Saqqara, Maya, a wet nurse, would raise him. Since Egyptians rarely depicted princes, we really know little of his early years. Tutankhaten eventually succeeded Akhenaten at about nine years old, inheriting an empire in disarray. Soon Tutankhaten embraced the gods of his forefathers, even having himself depicted in their image. He then changed his name to Tutankhamun to honor the former national god of Egypt, Amun. The boy king would never reach his goals of completely restoring the traditional beliefs, for he died unexpectedly at about 19 years of age. Why did he die? Was it a sudden illness, an accident, or was it murder? It's hard to know exactly what caused Tutankhamun's death, but recent CAT scans that were done by the National Geographic Society have proven uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt that the damage to the back of his skull was not because of an attempt at murder and it seems to have been a post-mortem event. So did he die from another cause? It's hard to say. Uh, there is a possibility that there was a wound on his leg which did not heal correctly and he may have died of uh, blood poisoning. When I moved the mummy and I put it under the CAT scan machine, I found out he died at the age of 19, and I found out that this hole in the back of the head was opened in Dynasty 18 for the Egyptian to put the liquid for mummification. And we found out that there is a fracture in his left leg, and he uh, had an accident one day before he died. What kind of an accident? We didn't know. Tutankhamun was probably too young for his tomb to have been completed. So preparers had to make alternative plans for his burial during the 70-day period they had while mummification was taking place. One of the first steps in preparing Tutankhamun's body for burial would have been removing his inner organs and preserving the lungs, liver, stomach, and intestines. Each had its own container. This solid gold coffinet is inlaid with carnelian and colored glass. It portrays the king as Osiris, with his arms crossed over his chest and holding the royal insignia of the crook and flail. Each organ was guarded by a different god. All four were the sons of Horus. This coffinet held the pharaoh's stomach. The small tomb, never meant to be a royal burial, was finally readied for the king, with one of the four small chambers decorated as a burial chamber. This chamber would be stocked with treasures beyond belief, and it remained hidden until early in the 20th century. When we come back, more from our story, and a preview of some of the many treasures that will be on display in a brand new exhibition that will make its North American debut at the Atlanta Civic Center this fall. British-born Howard Carter moved to Egypt in his late teens. He had incredible artistic talent and was able to use that skill, working as an illustrator for archaeologists. He served with some of the best field archaeologists and used his time wisely, learning valuable lessons from the masters. He would eventually become an archaeologist himself. Always in the back of his mind, was his desire to work in the Valley of the Kings. The Earl of Carnarvon also had a great interest in Egypt and had visited the country in part 
for the health benefits it offered his frail constitution. Like Carter, Carnarvon was also fascinated by Egyptian archaeology. And this common interest would bind the two men. There had actually been indications uh, that perhaps the tomb of Tanagamon was still to be found. An embalming cache, that is fragments left over from making the mummy and the funeral feast, had been discovered by an earlier excavator, Theodore Davis, who mistakenly thought that was all that was left of Tanagamon's tomb. But in fact, it indicated that there was a tomb possibly still nearby. Despite the warnings of wasted time, and the conclusions of a few colleagues who had declared that nothing of value was left to be found in the valley, Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon took their opportunity to start excavating. Carter knew that a few artifacts found in the valley bore the name of Tutankhamun. He pinpointed each of their find spots and circumscribed the area. Carter painstakingly excavated the area he had outlined, but season after season brought no success. Fines were meager, and to make matters worse, the work faced interruption due to the outbreak of World War I. After the war, Carter and Carnarvon resumed their excavations, but success still eluded them. The excavation in the Valley of the Kings is always interesting, and many people came here and they made all these discoveries. But Howard Carter, in my opinion, was a unique man. He was working in the Valley of the Kings. You know, he did major important things. In the tunnel of city, he is the one who restored this beginning of the tunnel. Eventually, Carnarvon's interest was beginning to fade. Luck was not with them. And in 1922, Lord Carnarvon told Carter he could no longer continue with the excavations. Carter was not about to give up. He immediately traveled back to England to meet with Carnarvon. Carter and Carnarvon sat down, and Carnarvon, who had gone to Egypt because he was in ill health, who had gone to Egypt because he couldn't stand the cold English winters, um, and wanted to entertain himself, and so started to fund a dig, and it got out of control. Um, and by this season, um, before the 1922 season, he was, he was going to pull the plug. It had become much too expensive um, for him to continue, and Carter said, look, I'll fund it if you don't find anything, but fund it. And I think I have a place to look where we haven't looked yet. When Lord Carnarvon found that this archaeologist really think that he will discover the tomb, he gave him the money. By early November, history was made. Carter had found the first step of a staircase of 16 steps that would lead to the tomb. After Howard Carter discovered the tomb, he really wasn't able to open it because he had to contact his, uh, his financial supporter, Lord Carnarvon, in order to have him come and be present at the opening. So he sent a telegram to Lord Carnarvon saying, at last have made discovery. Days later, a breathless Carter with Carnarvon behind leaned forward extended his candle into the first of the four chambers, and when questioned by his patron as to whether he could see anything, Carter uttered what may rank as one of the world's great understatements. Yes, wonderful things. November 4, uh, 1922, was a very important day in the field of archaeology. It is the first time actually that a major tomb to be discovered completely intact like this. But then the real work began. It took almost 10 years to clear, photograph, record, conserve, pack and ship an astounding 5,000 artifacts from the tomb in southern Egypt and move them to the Cairo Museum in the north. Well, the New Kingdom uh, as far as funeral ritual was concerned, was an era of conspicuous consumption. So tombs were loaded, not only with objects of daily life, uh, but also ritual objects and uh, magical instruments. Uh, Tutankhamun, of course, being a king, had even more. And then being the inheritor of the material from the tombs of his ancestors at Amarna, when the court moved back to Thebes, 
he was given those as well. So he had multiple sets of material. So this tomb was probably the richest one that ever existed. The ancient Egyptians believed that the afterlife was very much like everyday life. People placed many household objects inside their tomb for the next world. They also included shabtis, small mummy-like figurines of servants. When the deceased owner of the tomb reached the afterlife, he or she uttered a magical spell to summon the shabti to life. Some shabtis had tiny tools in preparation of their role in the next world. This shabti of Tutankhamun is unusual due to its size and details. Among the many treasures found in Tut's tomb were hundreds of items of jewelry to adorn the king, games for his amusement, vessels for oils, and as Carter himself stated, everywhere the glint of gold. Many of the objects in the tomb are made of gold or covered in gold leaf, uh, and gold had important religious significance to the ancient Egyptians. The, according to Egyptian mythology, the flesh of the gods was gold, which is why you have gold finger stalls and toe stalls on the mummies, and gold mummy masks. Because when you died, you actually became a god. You became one with the god Osiris. You know, gold were plenty in Egypt. We know the location of the quarry of gold in Nubia. We have the first map of gold in the uh, Museum of Turin in Italy. It shows to us exactly the location of gold. One good letter sent by the king of, uh, of Mitanni to Amenhotep III was telling him, send me gold, because gold in your country like dust. And the tomb of Tutankhamun was all the gold can show how Egypt, gold was everywhere. The discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb was the greatest archeological find in history. But soon tragedy would strike and the legend of Tutankhamun's curse would sweep the world. Lord Carnarvon died three months after the tomb's discovery, never living long enough to see for himself the ultimate prize, the coffin, the golden mask, and the mummy of Tutankhamun. You know, the curse of Tutankhamun actually is one of the most interesting stories that people love to hear all the time and became famous in the time of Tutankhamun because Lord Carnarvon gave exclusive to London Times to publish anything about the tomb. As a reporters, what they will say. And this is why they existed stories that anyone who will enter inside the tomb of Tutankhamun he will be murdered. This text is not true. And Lord Carnarvon death, three months after the discovery, also many stories happened to him. But I will tell you, I never really believed in the curse of the fairies. When we come back, a preview of some of the many treasures that will be on display in a brand new exhibition that will make its North American debut at the Atlanta Civic Center this fall. Many decades have passed since the discovery of Tutankhamun. Today, the sands of Egypt still hide many mysteries. Dr. Zahi Hawass is presently conducting his own archaeological expedition near the pyramids and the Valley of the Kings, where preliminary finds have revealed the entrances to two new tombs. Over 26 tombs for kings existed at this place, and more than 37 tombs for non-royal kings. But still, the valley never explored well, because there is many tombs of kings that never discovered until now, like the tomb of Ramses VIII and the tomb of Topon II, and all the queens of Dynasty 18, they should be buried here. All the excavation that has been done here, done by foreigners. And that's why I started the first Egyptian expedition in the valley, between the tomb of Ramses II and the tomb of his son, Merim Betah. You have this big mound, that I always believe that the tomb of Ramses VIII should be existed here. We have been excavating in this place since November 2007, and actually we came through a major discovery. You can see how really this area was completely covered, 
and our excavation revealed the beginning of the tomb. It shows stairs coming down, and if you look down here, you can see that this is exactly the same style of KV-63. I really cannot say if this royal tomb or non-royal tomb, because as we know, in the Valley of the Kings, the king can bury anyone looking at each tomb of the 63 tombs that found in the Valley of the Kings, each one has a story, each one has magic, each one is a mysterious place. And that is the pit that can lead us to the entrance of a new tomb, KV-64. And if we discover another intact tomb, the people will talk about this tomb all their lives. It will take the glory from King Tut. Excavators from all over the world work in Egypt, and a large group of Americans have been excavating at the site of Abydos, the area sacred to the god Osiris. And Dr. Joseph Wagner of the University of Pennsylvania recently began uncovering the unusual burial of a Middle Kingdom pharaoh. Um, we're here at South Abydos excavating uh, the tomb of Senwazert III. He's a king of the 12th dynasty who built one of the most magnificent tombs in all of Egypt, a, a huge underground tomb in which he was probably buried. Um, and we're excavating this tomb to recover evidence um, on the nature of the burial of this king. This place is a great uh, kind of uh, laboratory for studying ancient Egypt. Um, at this particular site, we have a royal tomb, we have a temple, we have uh, uh, cemeteries of local people, we also have a town. Um, so many aspects of ancient Egypt are reflected in the remains here. Most of my work has been here at Abydos. I've worked at a number of other sites in Egypt, um, Saqqara uh, being the main one. Uh, my, my true love is for Abydos, however, um, the reason being uh, this is one of the greatest uh, ancient centers of ancient Egyptian civilization, but in many ways one of the least explored, um, uh, despite there being more than 100 years of work here. Um, everywhere we look, we're discovering new things. And so, you know, there are many centuries, in fact, of future excavation here, I think. But excavating is only part of the ongoing work in Egypt. Conservation is at least as important. Pollution and other negative environmental conditions threaten Egypt's existing monuments and artifacts. As excavations reveal new finds, they too are subject to extensive damage. All of us now need to be concerned about the future of the past. I sometimes close tombs. This is the only way to preserve them. Like I close the tomb of city. It's a unique tomb that cannot be repeated. And I would like to close the tomb of Tutankhamun. But this will come through uh, the site management program that we are doing not only for the Valley of the Kings, but almost for every site in Egypt. The pyramids and the Sphinx and the treasures of Tutankhamun provide a glimpse into Egypt's past. Its legacy, however, is so much more. Egypt's great architects gave the world building techniques and elements we still use today. Their scientific knowledge produced medical papyri and the first scene of medical implements. They created the world's first zodiac, and their artists produced some of the most beautiful and accomplished statuary of all times. Over the years, the sands of Egypt have revealed many of these treasures, and today we have a rare opportunity to see a large group of them, along with more than 50 artifacts from Tut's tomb. Since 1922 and through the 70s, Tut mania has gripped the world. And now once again, Tutankhamun returns to the United States in all his glory. Tutankhamun, the Golden King and the Great Pharaohs is a new exhibition from Arts and Exhibitions International in cooperation with Egypt's Supreme Council and National Geographic. Well, this is a great opportunity for Atlanta. Uh, people were very uh, disappointed when the first Tut show in the 1970s bypassed Atlanta. We waited a long time for this show to come to Atlanta, and it was well worth the wait, because this show is much larger than the original Tut show. This exhibit includes spectacular artifacts from Tutankhamun. But even more, it details not only the discovery, reign, and burial of the best-known Egyptian pharaoh, it presents a comprehensive analysis of ancient Egyptian pharaohs over a span of more than 2,000 years. 
Amenemhat III reigned during the Middle Kingdom from around 1818 BC to 1772 BC, during a time of prosperity and peace. His body is youthful, but his features show a more mature ruler. These mythical creatures, with the head of a king and the body of a lion, embody the authority of the pharaoh with the power and virility of a lion. Sphinxes often guard an entryway or define a boundary. The most famous is the Great Sphinx of Khafre at Giza, a momentous structure carved out of a single piece of stone, standing over 65 feet tall. It guards the front of Khafre's pyramid complex. Senemut, a famous architect, was thought to be Hatshepsut's lover. He was also tutor to her daughter, Princess Neferuri. Here we see him affectionately embracing the young child. Pets, mostly cats and dogs, often appeared on monuments. This limestone sarcophagus was carved for the pet cat of Akhenaten's older brother, Prince Tutmos. Tutmos was first in line for the throne, but died before he could become king. Itishedu was an overseer of tomb builders during the times of Khafre and his father Khufu. These statues are unique because they show a low-ranking official at different stages of his life. Here we see a proud older man comfortable with his social status. This simple bed made of white painted wood was found in the antechamber of Tutankhamun's tomb. The mattress is made of woven reeds and the bed's legs are in the form of lion's feet. Egyptians most likely lay with their heads toward what we would consider the foot and their feet toward the headboard. I hope that people will take away from this exhibit uh, an appreciation for the great beauty of Egyptian art, the long-lastingness of their civilization, uh, their great humanity. Uh, in many ways, they're the ancestors of our own civilization. Uh, and also, I hope that they'll support the Carlos Museum so that we can have Egyptian art in Atlanta all the time. Visitors will come face to face with some of the greatest names in Egypt's history. Khafre, the builder of the second pyramid at Giza. Hatshepsut, the first woman who ruled as a king. Akhenaten, the ruler who introduced the concept of a single god. And Ramses, whose name and exploits appear prominently in the Bible. A gallery of traditional gods will provide an overview of the hundreds of gods that comprise the traditional religion. And a spectacular gallery will house the gold of the pharaohs, exquisite creations of gold, silver, semi-precious stones, and glass. And the solid gold death mask of Susenes I of the 21st dynasty. Well, this exhibition is a wonderful introduction to ancient Egypt because it spans the gamut of Egyptian civilization from its earliest heights in the Old Kingdom all the way to the late period uh, and shows the great high points uh, of Egyptian history. So it puts Tutankhamun in context. So it's a very rich exhibition. So I think it will really uh, benefit anyone who sees it and really give them a good introduction to Egyptian civilization, as well as the story of archaeology, because we have represented some of the greatest finds in Egyptian archaeology, from the first pioneers, Mariette and Maspero, to Zahi Hawass, who's done so much uh, for Egyptian archaeology. So it's really a wonderful celebration of the material of ancient Egypt. No other civilization lasted so long nor produced such a wealth of information about its culture. But the search continues. All of the questions have not been answered. Egypt's legacy to the modern world is an ongoing process. <laughs>